Hey, we're back with another episode, Duplication Nation MLM Podcast. If you're here for the first time, where the hell have you been? <laughs> we do a couple of these every month. Uh, <laughs> but if you're new here, actually, it's a very unique format, long form content, not superficial soundbite clickbaity stuff. Uh, it's this is what we call the chopping it up series. I get a partner each episode and we just chop it up back and forth. We pretend you're not even there for you guys listening or watching on the YouTube channel. Uh, and I just get a partner each episode and we have a conversation about the real world stuff, what's going on in the space. And my lovely and talented partner this week is back for round two. The uh, beautiful Miss Anne Feinstein, welcome back, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. I'm excited to be here with everyone. Well, we could start two ways. One, I could ask you what you think is the most interesting thing in going on in the space right now, or I could defer to you and you can propose whatever you think the first topic should be. <laughs> you know, I think that's a good topic to start with, because uh, as we look at the profession, I mean, you and I have been in this profession now for 30 some years each. And I started in my 30s. Um, so you kind of get an idea on numbers here. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed by it, because I just think it's a reality. And it shows the longevity of what we have in our profession. I think that it is time, though, that we really give some consideration, serious consideration to looking at how we can attract the younger millennials. And that is, you know, really looking at, you know, the ways in which we do the business, you know, how we're uh, talking about it, the tools that we use, the systems. I mean, they all really live on their phones. <laughs> they live and breathe on their phones. Um, I can remember when we were talking about going mobile, you know, that was a big deal. Go mobile. Everything was go mobile. And, you know, what does that entail? You know, what was that at that point? Because everybody, all of us were stuck behind our computers and the communication was all about, you know, sitting down in front of your laptop or your desktop or whatever. But going going um, on a mobile sense and being able to attract the younger crowd, we've got to have tools that, you know, will do the job and help them, will assist them. We've got to find ways to communicate as well, you know, using the various apps and the texting. I mean, <laughs> you and I laugh about it, but if you call somebody on the phone these days, okay, I can tell you that, you know, my younger relatives, family, friends, whatever, when I call them on the phone directly without texting them first, they think something drastic has happened. Oh my God, what happened? So, you know, entering into the texting environment, um, I remember sitting in a client office and there were two young executives, <laughs> millennials sitting in front of me and we're talking over uh, various issues and so forth. And, you know, the things that we wanted to get done and they were sitting there on their phones and it was pissing me off royally because I thought they were sitting there, you know, ignoring what I was talking about. And so finally I just slammed my hand down on the desk, stood up and I said, well, I guess this is over. And they all looked up and they looked at me and said, why? And I said, well, it's obvious that, you know, you prefer to be texting on your phones. <laughs> and this was the line. We're getting done what you're suggesting while you're talking. They were texting it to the people who were involved. And I have to tell you, I just broke up laughing because <laughs> I realized what we were talking about was just that going mobile and doing something different than what we had done before. And, you know, you and I always say that that makes the greatest impact when you're open and willing to learn, when you're open to new ideas, when you're open to new cultures, you know, that's really what makes this such an exciting profession um, that is dropping down all the beliefs that we've had in the past and accepting what's in front of us, being in the moment with the people that are in front of us. And in that moment, 
I realized that I needed to make a change. I needed to be thinking more along the lines of this mobile technology. I needed to be thinking about the tools and the systems and the pathways and all that that we needed to put into place. I needed to be thinking about how we would attract those people and, you know, being able to create the next generation. I mean, Randy, isn't that the whole key here that, you know, creating generations of people that we're working with to mean to, to have a sustainable business? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, a lot of things spin off from that in my mind. Uh, I went home to visit my mother and we were going to meet my sister and her son at a Milwaukee Brewers game. So we were driving from Madison to Milwaukee and the traffic was just insane. And it was just backed up for like 20 miles outside the stadium. And I said, oh, come on, there's got to be a better way. So I opened up Waze and I found a way through, you know, they directed me through the residential neighborhoods where there wasn't a traffic jam. But my mother, this was such a mind bending experience for her that we were sitting in the car stuck in traffic. And I had this magical thing on my phone that told me where to go. Uh, <laughs> And I, you know, there's places I go there, I go now and I, you know, I go to park and it's like park by mobile. And that's, you know, they don't even have parking meters anymore. I'd say, what would my mom do if she was coming here to visit the chiropractor or something? She doesn't even have a mobile phone. That's how much the world has changed. And that meeting with you, I think th that was your notice that we all get at some point that what originally was just a distraction entertainment item, these mobile phones are actually the most productive supercomputers in history for getting shit done. And really, uh, I was at the doctor's uh, office and they gave me a couple of things that they wanted me to buy and say, here, take these at home as a follow-up. And, uh, so then at the end, the, the nurse was saying to me, OK, and remember, you need to order. And I said, oh, I already did. She's like, what? I said, yeah, I did it on Amazon while you were working on me. Like, oh, my God, you're such a good patient. I wish everybody did. But that's what the phones do. They give us that opportunity for instantaneous action to really be productive. They're very dangerous and pose a lot of other challenges in other ways because they are distraction factories. They can be if they let them, if you let them. They, they are really playing a role in radicalizing people. And by this, I don't mean um, somebody in a suburb all of a sudden becomes a jihadist and they're bombing skyscrapers, although that happens, right? But I mean, the real world, real people, just normal people have become radicalized um, because there's such polarizing political dissent that uh, and the the algorithms just know how to keep feeding you clicks that are going to, you know, bait that's going to keep you clicking. And people become, uh, to me, I, I call them crusaders. So they become a crusaders for everybody should wear, still be wearing masks, or they become crusaders that no one should ever wear face masks. They become crusaders that people who don't want to take a booster should be held down in the doctor's office and the, the nurse jab them by, you know, and force them to take it. Uh, people become crusaders for the other side that, you know, these vaccines shouldn't they haven't even been properly tested yet. Um, <clears throat> and you can make arguments on either side, any side of any of those cases. But that's not the issue. The issue is people getting radicalized where they are just turning into crusaders. So that, you know, I have friends who are just crusaders on certain topics and they want to send me three to eight posts a day on the rabbit hole that they're going down. And I just have to say, you know, dude, I, I can't have this right now. I'm running a business. I, I'm an entrepreneur. 
I don't work for corporate America. I don't get a sit in a cubicle and get a paycheck. I'm an entrepreneur. My lifestyle is based on what I accomplish and what, and I like to live well. I spent the first 30 some years of my life desperately poor. I hated it. I've spent the second half of my life desperately rich <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> and I don't want to change that. So don't, I, I don't have time for those crusades. There's whatever crusade you want to get, there is a rabbit hole you can go down that will just polarize you. And I think that's one of the challenges we're facing now is we are bringing in uh, digital natives, people who grew up with smartphones. Uh, so they live on them, as you say, and they can use all those apps and they can be all that productivity. And they're also exposed to all that negativity and all that neg it's just so much divisive, polarizing programming. Uh, again, I actually just um, this week shut down my Twitter account, put the last post, hey, I'm declaring bankruptcy on this account. Uh, and I opened a new Twitter account for anyone watching. It's Real Randy Gage, at Real Randy Gage on Twitter. And I'm just shutting down all the other stuff again. I'm going to give Twitter one more shot with following a few hundred people and not being followed by all the bots and the 150,000 followers I had that none of them can see my messages because they have the shadow banning. And, you know, you could I could make a post to... 150,000 people and maybe a thousand are going to see it anyway. So I said, you know, I'm just going to throw that account away. I do have people that I like to receive information from that I think are really brilliant people that I like to follow on Twitter. And so I'm just going to start over on that and not even make it like a public thing. I'm going to go back to Natalie and Fede, who you, you know, work with also on social media. I'm just going to let them handle my accounts in terms of posts and blog posts and podcasts and things. But I'm just out of that world again. I left it. I came back when I started Duplication Nation because I wanted to be able to promote what we're doing here, like things like this podcast and the MLM Confidential Newsletter. Uh, but it's just so toxic. It's just so polarizing. It's so time consuming. It's it's such a intellectual suck. I, was, I knew you were going to say that. You know, I, I just I look at that when I see that, and I just say, "Hey, how's that working for you?" That's my favorite new question. How's that working for you? Because most people they'll sit back and they realize, you know, what they've been doing, and you know, I just say, "Listen, you know what? I love you. Don't want to talk politics." don't want to talk religion and don't want to talk about sex. Okay. And if it gets vulgar or anything along those lines, it's just cut out. You know, I, I protect my mind, you know, as much as I can, as much as I protect my home, my family, my surroundings, you know, um, a friend of mine was talking yesterday. was interested. I love listening to him because he's a sharp, brilliant businessman. And every time he comes on to any social media, he talks with, you know, his strategy. It's not that, you know, who is his, uh, you know, the uh, the, the uh, financial level of his, of his customers. It's not, you know, what they're doing, what they're involved in, you know, their age range. <clears throat> He's looking for customers who want, who want to feel good, who want to feel their best, who think they deserve a good life. And that's why I thought, you know what, that's why I find that attractive. Because everything that he talks about is about creating a good life. You know, being an entrepreneur and being able to create what you want to create around you. And, you know, I, I found that that's the kind of environment that I want to create, whether it's in my home, whether it's with my family, whether it's with clients. You know, I want to create an environment where they look forward to being together. You know, they look forward to that energy. They look forward to, you know, the the um, the learning factor, you know, opening their minds, you know, looking at 
what they can do differently, how they can grow. I want to be around people like that. I know you want to be around people like that because that changes everyone and the environment around us, which then starts to create this, you know, this rippling effect so that people begin to realize that you don't go to Anne with that. I mean, on many times I say, oh, we don't go to Randy with that because <laughs> I just know, you know, it's what we create around us. And I think that could be one of the greatest protections to avoid what you're talking about, you know, going down ugly rabbit holes and, you know, looking at the negativity of life. I, I don't choose that. You know, I'm to a point in my life where I want to be around people that enrich me. I want to be around uh, situations that, you know, make me excited and grow. You know, get up in the morning, like you say, throw your covers off and get at it. You know, and that's the kind of, that's where I'm at. And I think that is attractive. And so my social media stuff is all reflecting that, you know, reflecting that energy and the energy and the people are are coming back and saying, you know, I look forward to it because you have that positive, business-minded, forward-thinking energy. And guys, I got to tell you that that's the secret to staying young and healthy. That really is the secret. OK, the secret is, you know, obviously to eat well, exercise well, you know, take the supplements, feed your body what it needs. But it's also what you feed your mind. OK, and what you allow in your space. So, you know, I look at, you know, we you and I talk about this all the time, our legacies. You know, what are we leaving in this profession, being in the, in 30 years in this profession? You know, what is the legacy? And I want, that's the legacy that I want to leave. OK, I want to I want people to know that I loved every part of this profession and I loved working with people and cultures and clients, you know, that had that were looking to create change, that were looking to make an impact. You know, those are the things that I think make the most the most significant um, changes in the world. You know, I look at. And, and I know you've been there, too, where you've looked at cultures, you look out into an audience and you see cultures of all different types. And had they been in the political world, they'd probably be, you know, smashing heads and doing crazy, crazy stuff to each other. But they're sitting there in this environment of working together. And isn't that one of the most beautiful things about our profession? Yeah, we do reach across the borders. We reach across the cultures. Because it. When you're in a shared commonality like this, a common experience, it forces you to look at what are the things you uh, have in common as opposed to what you have apart. It's not that um, like you brought up the, you know, the, the three things you never talk about sex, politics and religion. Um, I'm my choice. <laughs> well, and that's a, com you know, that's a common thing you hear for a decade. That's like conventional wisdom. I actually have regular dinners with a group of friends where we pretty much just talk about sex, politics, and religion, right? Uh, we meet on South Beach. <clears throat> we'll have a dinner. We might talk two and a half hours. Or they'll come over to my condo or we'll go to one of their places and we'll have a four-hour, five-hour, six-hour evening. You said something very important. Close friends well right this is where i'm going with that is environment we have a jewish person there we have a, a devout uh uh atheist we have a guy who went to uh, divinity university instead oral roberts university we have agnostic we you know what i mean and um but we're having respectful mind opening conversations to learn about other people's perspectives. And we do that with politics. And because again, we have people across the spectrum and even with sex. So, um, but that's, that's what social media can't let you do because it doesn't feed their economic model because their econo uh, economic model needs to outrage you and cause you to be fearful and drive you down that rabbit hole so you're on those sites longer and so they can sell your eyeballs to the advertisers. <laughs> so that's the difference. Um, when we get 
a group of people together at an international convention and you have people from uh, Indonesia and Malaysia and Belgium and Norway and America and Mexico and Japan and uh, Ecuador, man, you, you have to find those shared things and what those shared things are in our space is they still have the ability to dream. They're willing to work for that dream. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to go to school to learn a craft. What we have is a craft. The thing I keep, th that I always try to get across to people is, okay, look at the basic skill sets. How do you meet people? How do you work a candidate list? How do you make compelling invitations? How do you get people in front of external source tools that make presentations? How do you follow up afterward? This is a skill set, the equivalent of becoming a master carpenter. It's the skill set of becoming a brain surgeon. It's the skill set of becoming a, a professor of uh, political, you know, whatever at the university in an endowed chair. It's this craft that you've learned. And that when what, what I want people to understand is once you understand that craft, once you become proficient in that craft, you will never have to worry about earning a living for the rest of your life again. Absolutely. I can parachute you anywhere in the world and you can make a living for yourself and your family. Even if you don't speak the language, I can take somebody from uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and parachute them into Seoul, South Korea, and they don't know a single word of Korean. They will find one bilingual person who has a dream, is willing to work for that dream, and wants to learn a craft. And that's how you open up south korea and that's how you open up denmark and that's how you open up panama or any of those places even the, you know in the u.s right the if you look at somebody with a huge team here they'll be the first to tell you oh yeah i got my big russian line oh i have the filipino line in california i got a huge mexican line in uh texaco uh, texas and uh california and miami and new york and blah 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 um it's the, the secret of building that is you just you find one bilingual person who has a dream and wants to learn that skill set. And so we really can, once you develop that skill set, we can parachute you into any free country, right? You can't do it in North Korea, you can't do it in China, you can't do it in Cuba. But any any free country in the world, and there's almost 200 of them, you'll be able to do a living for yourself. And that's the commonality that holds us together. That's why we can have a convention and have women in burqa sitting next to fundamentalist Christians, sitting next to Orthodox Jews, sitting next to agnostics and people of no faith. And everybody's there for the same reason, which is, hey, how do we become the highest possible version of ourselves. That's total transformational thinking. That's that's truly, you know, what, what we have here right in a bottle. <laughs> because yeah. everything changes. I mean, I can remember coming out of um, teaching and then corporate America and stepping into the profession and saying to myself, oh my goodness, you know, if I, I learn a few new skills, the world opens up to me. And that's exactly what happened. You know, the, the world opened up and exactly as you laid it out, meeting somebody who's bilingual in a foreign country opens the door or meeting somebody who's bilingual in our country here in the U.S. opens the door. OK, and the next thing you know, you have this beautiful OK family of entrepreneurs all working together, locking arms and making change, you know, you and I are working with a client now, and I love the fact that 
They have, you know, it's like 40 plus countries open. Countries that you and I have never been to. I mean, believe it or not, actual countries that you and I have never been to. And meeting <laughs> cultures of people that, you know, frankly, I probably wouldn't have met. And sitting down and having conversations, first of all, working together very closely on the corporate side, but also with the top team leaders, the diamonds in this company. <laughs> That's just, like you said, they all have dreams. They all have burning desires. They have such passion. <clears throat> They're looking to make change. They're open to wanting to learn a few new things. And that's pretty That's pretty amazing for, you know, some of those people have been around our profession, you know, for 12 plus years. And, you know, you would think they would have an attitude of, well, you know, I know this, I know that. They are so excited and so hungry to learn, you know, new things. And, you know, I can remember one of the things that, was really satisfying for me coming from you. And I'll be honest with you and let say this to you was the first time that I was going to speak outside of the team. I was going to speak on a world stage at the mastermind event and waking up and feeling so stressed at the idea of doing this <clears throat> and what it would entail and how I would you know, be able to pull my thoughts together and create something, an impactful uh, presentation that would tell a story and tell lots of stories, actually, but also make some significant points. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what do I have to talk about? And you had said to me, you know, you've got at that time, I think it was 25 years of experience. OK, you've got a lot to talk about. And we started to hone in on exactly the things that needed to be done. And that was, you know, what is the, what is the premise? What is the opening line? What is the closing line? What are the four, three or four points in between? And what are the stories you're going to tell to anchor those points? Do you know, you can tell that this has stayed with me all these years. Okay. Exactly those words. You know, you, I'm going to wake you up in the middle of the night, Feinstein, and I'm going to punch you in the arm and say, what's your opening line? <laughs> and you know, I took those skills and that skill set that you graciously gave to me. OK, and I have bestowed that onto four incredible leaders who are going to grace the stage at a convention. OK, in about a week. And they are so freaking excited okay, mm -hmm. that that whole concept of platform uh, mastery, you know, being able to walk onto the stage, take a three second pause. Okay, look around and then opening line. I mean, the first time I said that, I think they were going to faint because <laughs> they hadn't thought of that. But they're all platform speakers. I mean, this is the beautiful thing. These are not brand new to the profession. These are prof these are people that have built sizable, multi-global, um, international country businesses. So they're sitting there and they're like drinking it in. And it's so wonderful because... I know this will make a change. This will make a difference. And you can see it. And they want to be the best they can be. And see, that kind of coaching and that kind of mentoring just feeds my soul. I mean, it feeds me in such in, in, in a way that, you know, um, it feels like I have that energy of throwing the covers off every morning. You know, I get to do this. I get to do this. I get to work together with you. I get to work with these people. See, that's that's what I, I hope people come away with in this profession that, you know, we, we can bestow some amazing uh, skill sets to people that can transform their lives and give them confidence levels that they've never had. Or they may have had, but take it to another level. I can remember walking onto that stage as a result of what you taught me and gave me as that beautiful gift. You introduced me and I walked on stage and I remember that three second pause. <laughs> it was the longest pause of my life. And then I started and I told stories along the way that I have people coming up to me. I have people coming up to me, and this is years ago, that tell me that was the most impactful experience because they felt that they went along on this journey, you know, in this 30-minute presentation, 
and it opened their mind to things they could do in their own business because of the stories that I shared and the principles that we taught. Okay. So to me, that is a huge legacy impact. Okay. That I, I love getting those kinds of feedback. What about you in terms of your legacy? The legacy for me is the the people. I mean, the there is certain things that have happened, right? I've created the single most uh, uh, the the most popular single audio, uh, you know, recruiting tool that was ever created. I wrote the book that is the number one most read book in the profession. I'm done those things, opened up network marketing in Croatia and Slovenia and Macedonia and the Bahamas and places that it had never been. So I've had that kind of thing because for me, it's 44 years now that I'm in this space. So I've had four decades plus to make an impact. And obviously, I chose to use that platform well, and I, I made an incredible impact. Uh, but the legacy is the people like the, to me doing this chopping it up series has been so rewarding. Uh, Eric Gamio, who we both love and adore, you know, he finished my direct selling success book and he called me, he said, dude, that last chapter when you wrote the letter to yourself, I didn't know you were going to make me cry when I read this book. If you saw Luca Maloney when we did this show, he was literally in tears at the end. So grateful for <clears throat> some things that I've been able to share with him and Lily. And so, I mean, for me, I I am that guy who was, <clears throat> there's no other way to say it. I'm just uh, trailer park trash with cash, <laughs> right? I come from this really simple, poor background, uh, uneducated family. My kid sister, Lisa, is the first person in my entire family ever who went to college. Um, so I come from this uh, unsophisticated, uneducated, blue collar background. Mm -hmm. And when I got in the business, that were the only people that were attracted to the business. White collar people, for foreigners who may not know the idiomatic of English, we, we say blue collar workers are like construction workers, people who do physical labor, they take a shower after their job, right? White collar people, they take a shower before their job, they have executive positions they probably not doing physical labor right so the people we were bringing into the business for the first 20 years i was in it was only the blue collar people because the white collar people like well, why would i do that i don't want to you know paddle cosmetics or vitamins or skin care or whatever and whereas people who were digging ditches or washing dishes like i was <clears throat> this was like wow this is, you're telling me I can escape trading hours for money? The idea of leverage was, it, it is, and I still think to this day, I still say it's the sexiest part of our profession, right? So um, that's what attracted me to it, the idea that I could do leverage, that I could escape that trading hours for dollars. And I, but I didn't own a suit. I didn't own a tie. They told me, you know, I joined Amway. It was the first company I, I joined. And they were like, you get a blue suit, a white shirt, and a red tie, probably a red striped tie, right? And so that's what I did. And, you know, I, so to this day, and I still, I like my, I like my team to look sharp. Um, we don't really wear ties anymore. Um, I have no problem. I'm going to be on stage a lot of times wearing jeans and a sport jacket um, and a pullover shirt, perhaps, or whatever. But it's still going to be on purpose. Exactly. Right? It might be a $6,000 sport jacket. 
I might be wearing a, or I might be wearing a $20,000 sport jacket with a $20 Swatch watch, or I'll be wearing a sport jacket with a $60,000 watch, right? I, you know, people will know, okay, this isn't just some borracho off the street. This is somebody who's accomplished something. They, they're going to see me on stage and they're going to say, this guy has gravitas. This guy has presence. He's not playing the dog and pony show game. He's obviously very comfortable in his own skin. He's not trying to uh, follow some template for dress, but he has shown, he's showing, let's say it's a, an opportunity presentation. He's showing the candidates in the audience that he's a credible guy and he is expressing himself, you know, it's like, you remember, I used to joke about that. I used to wear earrings quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I people say, well, G Gage, why are you wearing earrings? Because that's going to alienate some. And I, you remember, and I know, you know, because I used to say this all the time. Listen, when you're making $125,000 a month, you can wear earrings because it just means you're eccentric. Okay. If you're making $125 a month and you're making earrings, you're just gay. <laughs> That's just the way it is, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right? So you earn the right to express yourself and get taken seriously by what you accomplish or the work that you do. Um, but I bring up the clothes thing because I think of, and I'm not going to say any names, but um, really good guy in Australia, and he had bought his first suit. And the pleat in the back was still stitched up because when they ship suits to the stores, they stitch them up to keep right. So I had to like take them aside. Listen, we need to clip this and let, you know, I've had people come to meetings and they still have the label of the manufacturer of the suit on their sleeve because they don't know that that's, you know, that's advertising they send for when it's hanging on the store. But they're just going into some department store and they're buying a suit off the rack. It hasn't been tailored. It hasn't been fitted, right? Um, but I was that person. I was that person. And then you'd have a gala dinner. And I'm like, okay, is is this bread plate mine or is that that person? Is this iced tea one? You know, I'm going to wait and see till these people on each side of me drink their iced tea so I know which iced tea is mine, right? I was that uh, you know, I say trailer park tribe. We didn't actually live in a trailer park. We live in a very small apartment. Um, but I was the equivalent of what we would in slang in English call trailer park trash. Um, I've been, my legacy is the people that I've been able to touch to help them go through that process. I think of another lady who was on welfare, two young kids sleeping in her friend's basement and she i got her to thirty thousand dollars a month in income wow and the thirty thousand dollars was amazing um but the really amazing part was the 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 behavior she demonstrated for her two young kids the the living example she was of being on welfare in that basement and never giving up and becoming financially wealthy to be able to support those kids. You remember when we were, I don't remember if it was, uh, no, it wouldn't have been Panama. It would have been uh, probably in Peru because the guy, remember the guy who came in the back of the pickup the chickens with chickens over the mountains from Colombia to Peru or Peru to, right. Peru to Colombia, right? I just remember being in the auditorium, there's like 10,000 people. And I heard this, I heard the arena, I was off stage, I heard the arena just going crazy. So I looked up on the jumbotron and what was happening was I was hugging that guy who had taken, because we had just had him on stage and he had told this story of traveling like 18 hours over the mountain in the back of this pickup with these chickens and everything. And so he came up to hug me after coming off stage and somehow the cameraman or director found that shot and put it up on the jumbotron. And I heard all these thousands of people and it was because I was hugging this kid. Um, 
the, you know, uh, in, um, he'll never, ever forget that moment. He'll never forget that moment. You know, it's like you're talking about your background and I can tell you, you want to hear the other side of it? <laughs> Hearing everybody have those remarkable stories coming from really adverse situations, whether it was, you know, uh, financial situations, living under a bridge, drug situation, you know, larceny, whatever. And sitting in the audience and looking at David and going, do you think we can be successful here? You know, coming out of corporate America, and he was a business manager for people in the entertainment industry. And then I came to this realization, which I think was significant. And that is looking at him and going, well, if they can do it, we can do it. So whatever the story was presented in front was, I saw the person's passion. I saw their dreams. I saw the aliveness that came into their lives as a result of the changes that they made. And I think that is, as you're saying, the people aspect. You know, I brought a, a business to Israel years ago through a dentist who was looking for a big change in his life. And he had a dental practice. He had many, many different offices around Tel Aviv. I, I don't remember the numbers, but his wife ran the offices. And he got to a point where he just said, you know, he was entrepreneurial and he was looking for a change. And he <laughs> answered this horrific ad that I had written in the New York Times. I mean, I might have, might have told you this, a three-line ad that started with, I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. But New York Times, I lived in New York. Uh, that's what that's what you did years ago. Um, health and wealth opportunity, part part time, full time. We will train. The weirdest people show up. Okay, the craziest, weirdest people show up. I mean, my David and I shared. I shared an office with David's accounting practice, and the receptionist would say, uh, <laughs> "Mary Jo is here." And I could hear it in her voice that Mary Jo is a weird, strange situation. <laughs> and I'd go out there and as I'm going by, I would say, hey, David, you know, like, come and rescue me. And mm -hmm. middle of all this, this wonderful guy, OK, shows up who happens to be a dentist from Israel. And of course, you know, I'm a nervous wreck because, you know, he's a dentist from Israel and I'm just get involved in this business and, you know, I'm learning new skills and everything else. So I pushed David to go do the presentation. And of course, David is sitting there, you know, telling the story the best that he can to the guy. And I realized, okay, I stepped into that moment and I'll tell you something. That was the, the turning point for me. Stepping into that moment and saying to myself, you know what? I know the story better than he does. Let me tell it. Told the story, the guy said, let's go open Israel. What? Really? Okay, we go to the owners of the company who happened to be uh, Chinese. So you can imagine they didn't, they were not familiar with Israel and the impact that it could have and the spread that it could have across the world. <laughs> so they go, okay. You know, they give a licensing agreement. This is years ago. This is what companies did years ago. They give a licensing agreement to this guy and we open up Israel. And then a war breaks out. Okay, just as we're opening the country. And needless to say, you know, that did put a little hamper into the situation <laughs> for, you know, several weeks because I see my team is sending me stuff through the mail, you know, where they actually mailed something with a stamp and it came from another country. Pictures of those people sitting with gas masks on, you know, holding up a product. And I'm just saying, I got to get over there, got to get over there, got to get over there. But the point of the story was, is that we were business professionals and he saw that and he saw that vision and he realized that he could work together with us and we could branch this into another country and the impact this has been many years many 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 years later we still remain in very good connection with each other the family the kids all grew up we saw all that that's the impact leaving a legacy and his wife just recently passed away mm. And it was, she was really a close dear friend of mine. And over the years, we became incredibly close. Oh, and when the girls called me, their daughters called me and told me what was going on because I knew she had been ill. You know, the most incredible thing, Randy, was the children getting these calls from around the world of people calling and telling them 
how amazing their mother was and the impact that she had on their lives. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, and I, and I sat there and I thought, wow, Edna, you know, Edna Horeen, what a, what a beautiful legacy you have left for the whole world. Okay. People will talk about this forever and ever and ever that, you know, you made a change. You and, and Nathan made a change in people's lives. We, we created prosperity in families and it radiated not only through Israel, but all through Europe into Latin America into Southeast Asia. You know, there wasn't a place in the world that wasn't touched by this, believe it or not. And I look at this and go back to the original conversation that we started with, you know, cultures coming together and working together. You know, the beautiful thing about that um, in our profession. And, you know, there's so many positive, incredible things um, that have gone on, you know, in working with people and working with clients and so forth. And I think one of the perhaps one of the biggest mistakes that some of us make is certainly been the mistake for me. And that is spending too much time with the wrong people. You know, believing in somebody so much and putting so much effort and time into someone when they weren't hitting the ball back. You know, now, a little couple of years later, I can stand back <laughs> and from the get go, working with whether it's a client or whether it's a top leader that I'm coaching, mentoring, it doesn't matter. You know, you and I have the same wavelength on this. You know, are we playing a good Raleigh back and forth? Are we hitting the ball back and forth? Do we have this, you know, this uh, meeting of the minds and act and, you know, the same level of action? And are we, you know, make moving the dial, as you say, <laughs> often, you know, we're always looking for that. Are we moving the dial? Are we working together? Is this, are things making, are we making things happen? Do we need to get together and sit down and have a, a serious conversation, you know, to clear the air? Guys, sometimes that's all is needed. When we communicate and we clear the air and saying to someone, and this might be, you know, something that's going on in somebody's organization, and that is, hey, let's have a, let's meet up, let's catch up, let's have a conversation. You know, yeah. what, what about you? What did, what have you found? that's help, been helpful in terms of past mistakes and going forward? Well, my biggest mistakes in the beginning were I was so argumentative. Mm. I was so, because that's where I was at as a person. I was this rat, you know, what the psychologist would call totally in your head. I came from a, a pretty emotionally stunted family of origin and didn't do emotions very well so and of course being on the spectrum accelerates that to the millionth power so I was just this rational logical analytical guy and I just couldn't understand why every single person I presented network marketing to didn't join instantly on the spot I joined instantly when that guy drew out those circles on the yellow legal pad. I was hallucinating. I had never seen leverage before. No one in my family had ever experienced leverage before. My entire family, trace it back to the whoever came over on the Mayflower, we all traded hours for dollars. Absolutely. Every single one of us, everybody, right? So when I saw that leverage, I was like, are you kidding me? Why isn't everybody in the world doing this? So I was just insulting people left and right. Like, how could you be so stupid? Why would you want to keep doing your job when you do that? Not understanding, of course, the distinction between an entrepreneurial personality versus an employee personality. Exactly. Like my mom, you know, for the first 20 years I was in the business. I would call her every week and we'd have the conversation. And then at some point in the conversation, she would say, have you given any thought to getting a real job? Uh <laughs> because that's what security means to my mother. You have an employer with a paycheck. I'm a complete diametric opposite of that. That is insecurity to me. Because if I'm relying on your paycheck to buy my groceries, 
I'm totally dependent on you. I have no freedom at all. Mm-hmm. Other people, and it's easy for to me, I'm like, well, of course, doesn't everybody understand that? No, there is a big chunk of the world that says, are you crazy? You're going to take the risk and you don't have a guaranteed paycheck Come on, on Friday? And what would happen if you can't pay your bills? And who's going to save you then? Um, and you have to, uh, but I was so arrogant and naive and unsophisticated and unable to process healthy, functional relationships. So I was just this bull in the China shop out there making all these presentations and then arguing with everyone who said no and making them feel stupid for saying no. And so it took me a lot of years, it took like five years to get over, you know, I went from arguing with people and then I got too big in people. (laughs) And then I got to, hey, okay, five years in, that's kind of when I had the um, come to Jesus meeting with myself and said, okay, come on, why is this not working? There are people in every company you've been in over five years, and I'd been in a couple dozen. I was an MLM junkie just bouncing from one deal to the next to the next, desperately looking for the the next hot thing. And come on, there's people in all of those companies who are making money, who are successful, winning those trips, driving those bonus cars, walking across those stages. What is the difference? And I realized, okay, I'm not doing the business in a way that my people can duplicate. Mm. And, you know, the big breakthrough for, and I talked about this on the, the breaking, you know, the chopping it up with you, not you, and, but you, the listener, uh, the viewer, where I did one, just me and the camera. I want to do one of those every couple of months. Um, just talking with the people who follow the podcast was, you know, I had experienced the, you know, I was in the inner sanctum of the top leaders at Amway back in the seventies where they're, you know, this, they they were a book of the month tape of the week industry. That's how they made their money was selling you know, mining the miners, selling tools to the miners instead of helping the miners get the gold out of the mountain. And uh, it was after that five years that I realized, hey, you know what? I could take what I saw those guys doing in terms of step-by-step duplicable system, but I could do it where I don't enrich myself with training and I don't enrich myself with tools. I enrich myself by creating true duplication, by bringing people in in a way that they will be able to bring people in, in a way that they will be able to bring people in and on and on and on. And And that's actually one of the first questions that people ask when they're looking at a business and a system, a business in our profession, that is, what is the system? You know, yeah, what- because that's where the that's where the long game is. There is, you know, we see it every time you work with a new leader, every time you work with a new company. Hey, I got this amazing person. She's an Instagram personality or she's a TikTok personality. She has 80,000 people following her. She has 2 million people following her. He has 1.5 million people. And he signed up, uh, you know, 120 people last month. Like, do you seriously, are you seriously having this conversation with me? Like you're suggesting that this Instagram or TikTok influencer who signed up 120 people last month is a good thing? You're actually encouraged by that? You're you're happy about that? You think you're going to plant your flag with that? What do you think those 120 people are going to do to replicate those results? The like, you know, I asked you what 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 you thought the most interesting thing in the space was. If if you ask me, what do I think the most interesting thing in the space is right now? It's the fixation with um, AI and platforms like Chat GPT. Um, understand. I I need to, uh, you know, preface this. These technologies 
can be very helpful for humanity. They can be very helpful to people in our business, and they will. There will be uses for them. Where we're at at this exact moment is there a complete distraction? There a complete misdirection? Mm -hmm. And even my own clients, I, I, you know, literally, I have a list right here. I will hold it up. This is based on a conversation with a client I have over in the EU on topics for their convention for me to train on. And number one, top of the list, it says AI and MLM. Because that's what the leaders are doing. Because they're reading all the blogs and the social media about that. And chat GPT, you're going to be left behind. And I've got my AI master course for $97. And I've got my $47 chat GPT ebook. What you got to understand is you will never out Amazon Amazon. Mm -hmm. You will never out Google Google. You will never out Apple Apple. You will never out Walmart Walmart. You got to think like a martial artist, like jujitsu is one of the disciplines I would suggest because you have to say, okay, am I really going to be able to know exactly what my customer wants better than the algorithms at amazon.com where they watch, they know every movie that this person watches and rated high, every TV show they watch and they binge watch in, every product they have bought for the last seven years, every personal care item, preference, deodorant, toothpaste, uh, blogs they read. We're going to follow them around the internet. You're not going to compete with that. What are you going to compete with? You got to compete with your humanity. Mm. That's what Amazon can't compete with you at. So you can't out Amazon, Amazon, and Amazon can't out you, you. And the you part of it, that's the humanity. That's when you talk about your friend and the, the legacy that she had and all the people around the world. And I think about your legacy. I think about my legacy. Um, I know that that legacy is the result of relationships that I had with people, yeah. human relationships, mm -hmm. where I saw something in them. And I said, I think you would be really amazing at what I do. And I got them to look at a presentation. And they looked at the presentation and they said, I'm going to give that a shot. Let's try this. Let's do this thing. And then I went to their living room mm -hmm. and crunched the carpet, standing in front of four people and a TV with a video on it. And, and, intro to presentation and took questions after the video. I was on a Zoom or a Facebook with them and their candidates. We went together to drive to a major event. We went and eight of us shared a hotel room at a major event and ate cheese sandwiches for a weekend because we didn't have money for airplane tickets and rooms and stuff. And we did whatever we had to do to get to that event. And then I traveled the world with them where we were in the Grand Wailea Resort watching the whales jump out of the water. We were scuba diving in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. We were in Dubai riding uh, ATMs across the desert, you know, sipping cappuccino at the Burj Al Jarab seven star hotel. We were um, at that why that amazing, where was the place with, 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 where? Gorgeous castle. We arrived in a helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. What was the place with, with Roger that we went to? Was that Costa Rica or was that Dominican where that big resort, the four seasons resort Costa where Rica, I with the ma the magic monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, with the that's, house of monkeys. That's the stuff. Amazon can't touch that. All right. I saw an ant eater in Costa Rica. 
And you say, what's the big deal? Well, how many people in the world, in the developed world, have ever seen an actual anteater? I stopped my car, or actually it was a bus, it was like a van. We were going, I'm like, stop it. I got out because there was this anteater on the road. And I just like, I have seen this since a child on the, you know, PBS or Nat Geo specials. Okay. I remember the Encyclopedia of Animals book that was one of my favorite books as a kid. And I think it started with, you know, probably Aardvark and then you had Anteater and whatever, and it went up to Zebra. And so when I saw the Anteater and then when I came out and there's four monkeys on my balcony of my chateau there, I mean, with the stuff like that, you know, scuba diving with those, the, the whales and the, the, the great sea turtles. And I mean, that's the humanity of, that's the relationship part of the business that even if you, if you were in the dorm room with Zuckerberg and you were a co-founder of Facebook mm -hmm. and you were one of the first six people and you created 500 millionaires from the you know first 800 employees or whatever i don't think it gives you the same kind of legacy that you get when you build a big team in network marketing because yeah if if you're a, a dot com darling billionaire startup guy yeah you made a bunch of people a bunch of money but you didn't have that relationship stuff that we have of being in someone's living room, of talking them down after their first rejection, working it through with them when their top leader drops out or takes a deal and goes to another company, um, being there when you're seven weeks in a row of back orders and there's no product to, to sell to your customers and the bonus checks are drying up, um, being there with that person who has that label on their jacket or doesn't know how to cut off the stitching in the thing or the stitching in the pocket and um, help, you know, be in there when they do their first presentation on stage, somebody who's been deathly afraid of making a presentation or public speaking. And now they're up there on a stage and, you know, they're presenting and loving it and being amazing and touching lives and, um, that's the stuff that, um, you know, the, so, you know, I, I, I'm kind of on a tangent with this because like I say, I, there'll be a point for chat GPT and stuff like this, where this is going to be, there's useful places for it, but that's not what anybody should be working on right now. That's not what anybody should be fixating on right now, What you should be fixating on right now is okay. Where, when is my next presentation that I'm going to be able to put somebody in front of it. It's the next Facebook Live. It's the next, here's my replicated website where we got this kick-ass new recruiting video that the company developed. How many people can I get in front of that presentation? Because if I can get somebody in front of an external source tool, I have a shot to ignite, most, most cases, reignite their dream and get them going in the business where I can be their partner and go down and do that new member orientation and help them through their major blast and help them through their grand opening and get them to study, do, and teach simultaneously. I'm going to get them into action in their first 48 hours in the business. I know we're going to make or break their career in that first two weeks, and I'm going to be there holding their hand, uh, guiding them, mentoring them, getting them through that so they live to fight another day, so they live to chase their dreams. And um, that's the stuff people got to worry about right now, not how is AI going to affect my business? No, how are you going to affect your business today? Who's on your candidate list that you need to be getting in touch with today and getting in front of a presentation. I say that all the time is, you know, who are you going to reach out to today? And you said something that's very interesting because I think as a leader in our profession, 
we have to look at what is that first tool? What, you know, is it telling the story? Is it telling it in a sexy way? Would it attract somebody to look at what we're doing? Because that is the first entry. And I want people to feel confident. I want them to feel excited. I want them to, to, to feel that they have something and they can't wait to get it into the hands of the people that they have been so wanting to talk to. And I can tell you that is a big obstacle, Randy, a big, big obstacle for a lot of people to start doing, as you say, the grand opening and the major blast. And that is having the right pathway, having the right tools in the pathway. And that first tool, you know, I was talking to someone this week who's with a major company, and we got into a conversation about this. You know, it's a, it's a leader and they're looking at their business and evaluating what's going on. And the conversation was, well, is this the right tool to be leading with? And you and I both looked at it and we came back and we said, well, you know, it's got some interesting points, but it's not talking to the customer. It's not talking to the person that we want to attract to make it, to give them a sense that this could be the solution that they're looking for. Nobody in the world knew that I didn't want to be a prisoner of a 40-story office building for the rest of my life. Nobody knew that. They saw it. What they saw was somebody who had, I was director of research for a leading Park Avenue consulting firm working 60 to 80 hours a week. So when this guy comes to me, and hands me a video and I see people like having a lifestyle <laughs> and mm -hmm. enjoying life and traveling. And there were people from all walks of life from, you know, the apple orchard farmer's wife, you know, to uh, people that were in professional positions that held, you know, positions within their communities, whether it was, you know, government, related, mm -hmm. business related, and they had a life. And I'm looking at this and I'm watching this video. I must have watched it six or seven times. And then I had said to myself, well, if I can get David to sit down and watch this video, okay, this is going to be a huge score because, you know, he was so engrossed in what he was doing as a business manager for the, in the music industry. If I can get him to look at this and I said, honey, sit down. I want to show you a video. <laughs> so he sits down, we're sitting together and I'm praying because we had cassettes. Remember those things? You put them in, you put them into the thing and they show up on your TV. It was interesting technology. You have to go research that <laughs> to find out what it was. And he's sitting there, like I could see, like, I'm doing it for her, you know, I'm going to watch this. And the next thing I know, he's so engrossed because guess what? Even with the biz being a business manager for some of the top entertainers in the world, guess who was who was chained to his desk and to the 13 little mouths that he had to feed in his office? And he sees again the same thing, the ultimate lifestyle, the concept of what we had, leverage. He had no leverage. He was the, the leverage was him, you know, is either talking to a client, you know, de business development uh answering questions dealing with the staff you know there was no leverage if he wasn't sitting there running the business yeah i mean he could go a day or two or whatever but then he had to be back ultimately when i got into the profession and i start building the business and he's looking over like this because you know he's already excited about it he's visioning lifestyle and i was you know a young gal looked up at him and said honey this is going to be our future you know, to which point, the good husband that he was, he tapped me on the shoulder, gave me a hug and said, go make money. <laughs> so <laughs> that was <clears throat> the, the the interesting beginning story for us. You should share some of the clients that David had so people know the level we're talking about. Because I remember being at a Sunrider convention, sitting next to Tony Regina, I think it was Tony. And Tony said to me, did you hear? I think it was Michael. Did you hear Michael Bolton thanked David Feinstein on the Grammys last night? Yeah, was that yeah. Michael Bolton who did that? Yes. David was yeah. in the audience with him. Yeah. So talk, I mean, just three or four the kind of clients that David had for people who 
because I, you know, there's so many people who do that. We say, well, I would never talk to him. He has that such important job. Oh, I, I could never approach her. She is so successful. She would never be interested in this. Talk about the kind of people David was working with that were his clients. Michael Bolden is still a household name today, right? He He's yeah. one of my favorite singers. I saw him do a concert at the Miami Metro Zoo when he was just starting out. There was like uh, 150 of us at this concert and we gave him six encores. <laughs> we, just, we would not let him go. It was so incredible. Yeah, he David represented uh, Michael as his business manager for many, many, many years, and they they had a great working relationship together. He also was a uh, business manager for Lou Graham, a foreigner. Foreigner, yeah, lead singer, and also the U.S. business manager for Led Zeppelin, Boney M, Bad Company, a lot of European bands that came into the U.S. They would use him. Um. And then he had a lot of different personalities on TV. I actually helped David <laughs> in the beginning of his career when he branched off to start his own his own practice. And um, I said, I, you know, it's so interesting because I was a director of research and these were the things that I did. So he said, you know, I want to break into Broadway. We lived in Manhattan. I said, OK. So I call up and I get all of the brochures for all the, uh, the you know, the little uh, playbills that you get when you walk yeah. into the, into the um, theaters. And I had them all shipped to me. And then he had this beautiful uh, business management brochure written about him and his firm. And we did a beautiful letter. And then I would sit there and I, you know, address all the envelopes and send them out. He had a huge huge following on Broadway as a result of that. And those Broadway people will tell other Broadway people. Right. So that's how it works, isn't it? One tells the next, who tells the next, who tells the next. Gee, what a concept. And that was, as you said, you could drop somebody into, you know, another country and they could start a business. Well, it just proves that if you have the skill set that we teach here, that you can do amazing things and you can even help you know, fa friends and family with their business because we have a skill set. And that's what I love about this. You know, being able to take what we had, you know, being a person who was working 60 to 80 hours a week in a consulting company and being a former teacher, those are skills. And then his business management, and I'll never forget the day when he's sitting there and he, it comes to this realization. What does she do? And now she's got these people in all these different countries building a business and he it's like that then he got the whole leverage idea and he comes to me one day and he goes you know what I want to sell the practice I want to join you in the business because you're having more fun than I am okay and I was like my head went around in 360 degrees because what I started to think is I've just recruited Michael Bolton's business manager to be in my business, which, you know, started in a little home-based thing and has grown into this amazing network around the world, so much so that he thinks this is a better opportunity than what he's doing. So it's 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 mindset. You know, it's it's what you see as as our profession and what it can offer people. And that ultimate lifestyle is so true. Find a business, find a company, find a product, Find a team, find the right people, and <clears throat> find a system. And when you can put all that together, okay, in, in a space with hands-on support, that's the other thing you mentioned earlier, the hands-on support. I can remember you sh showing up at my house in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Literally, <clears throat> came from the airport. I think you were in California at that point came from the airport to do a meeting. I mean, and I was a, a leader at that point. <laughs> I can remember calling everybody for the local market. I mean, I called people. I thought, Randy is coming. He, I have to have a full living room. I mean, I, I have to have a full living room. And I'm calling people. And one of the people that I called was my brother. 
And I said to my brother, you've got to be here. Okay, Randy Gage is coming to my house. <clears throat> you've got to be here. What time is it starting? Be here by quarter of seven. <clears throat> what time will I be out of there? You can leave by 7.30, you know, quarter of, whatever. All right. He shows up at 7.45. Like, it says, where is it? Is it starting? I introduce him to you. We take a picture. It's like you can already see him looking at his watch, you know, because he wants to get home with his family. He showed up for me. And we do the presentation. We use the tools, the videos, all that stuff that we just talked about. Okay. <laughs> and, and then you take over, <laughs> which was fabulous because it was truly what we talk about. You know, you stepped in and took over. And I sat back and I just let you do your thing. And I turn around to go enroll two women who have to leave and take them into the kitchen because they had to leave. And I'm enrolling them and I come out and I find my brother sitting on the sofa with you. <laughs> and I'm looking at my watch thinking, it's eight o'clock. He's still here. And mm -hmm. I could hear him saying, so, you know, he's asking you questions, you know, about leverage and about building this business and how it's done and blah, 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 blah. I will never forget that. He'll never forget that. When I when I mentioned that, he goes, Oh yeah, that was that was pretty enlightening that evening. You know, I I got a whole new perspective on it. And yeah, he's become customers with us in different businesses because he loves the products. But the point of the matter was is that it opened his mind to leverage. Okay. And it and it gave respect. Okay. He saw our business in a different light. The same thing happened when my parents came to an event that I had. You know, my father would very much like your mother, you know, when is she going to get a real job? I'd send her to school, you know, she got his education, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he comes to an event and he sees people from his officers from his synagogue. Okay. A lawyer, an accountant, another guy that he knew from the synagogue, somebody that they grew up with back in Philadelphia. And he's looking at this. Okay. And it was like, all of a sudden, I could see the cogs in his head change. She made a good decision. You know, coming into this profession was a good decision. And there was a peacefulness that changed every time we talked about it. You know, so we have to be the change, you know. And, and you know, I say this all the time. One of my favorite mottos is, you know, if you want things to change, you go first. If you want your family to be healthier, you go first. If you want your lifestyle and your business and your and your team to, you know, to have certain things that are changing, you go first. It has to be that way. And because I've lived it, you've lived it. Okay. We made the changes in order to move forward. What what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, listen, I know you have a hard close because you have an appointment you need to go to. Um, and this is only round two, and we will certainly have a round three and four and 17 and on and on. Um, well, forever since... and ever and ever, because you're in my life forever and ever and ever. And, you know, you're part of the family, the mishpucha here, okay, in our life. Yeah, it's, well, the, uh, so what I was going to say, uh, you know, we started this new tradition now. Uh, I started this tradition where I ask everyone to do their worst uh, presentation, so I want to leave you time for that. But I will, in response to what you say, because um, I think the Jewish community is very similar to the Asian community um, for parents with their kids. They want them to be, a you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. And <laughs> it's so funny when your parents came to the meeting and saw doctors and accountants and people like that in our profession. For me, what the changeover for people who don't know, my mom was an Avon lady. So she knocked on doors selling Avon. And then she eventually, by the time I was successful, they had made her like uh, the, the uh, kind of a supervisor where she had other Avon reps that she would help train. And maybe there was some kind of override there or something. She was like an area manager. They would bring her orders to her and then she would take them all to like the FedEx drop box once a week and overnight it in or something like that. And um, so, but every week was, have you ever thought about getting a real job? You know? 
And um, it all changed when she got a call from her boss, who was the division manager for Avon, you know, for like 20 states. And he said, listen, Avon is considering a, we're going to do a test program of network marketing. So we're having a big event in Chicago with thousands of people. And we're bringing in an expert to teach us about it. And I wonder if you know him because he's got the same name. He's, his name is Randy Gage. Is he related to you? And she's like, oh, my God, that's my son. And because her boss hired me to do a speech, that's, the, that's when her perception of the business changed was like, because there was nothing, you know, it's the hometown profit syndrome or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it was only when her boss yeah. brought me in. That's what, and that's what, that's part of the the journey we all have to do. Everybody's a hometown profit. That's why we always use external source tools. That's why you edify the sponsorship line so they can come to town and Talk to edify you. you to the people that you know and love. Um yeah. But anyway, so I know you're going to have to book. Um, what is the worst presentation you ever had? And and what what did you learn from it? Or what good came from it? Or what comes to mind? I, the, I'll tell you, the worst was the first. <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you, I think back to that. Um, coming from a company that was a Chinese herb company. Okay. There was a big thing about telling the story, you know, telling their history. And and I get that. That's That could be a beautiful origin story. But it's something you should show as a video, not feel as though you have to take people through the entire journey. <laughs> the 5,000 year history of <laughs> yeah. globalism in mainland China. Well, the teacher in me, okay, again, no structure, not the, the one video, okay, that I fell in love with. Uh, people were very down to earth, kind of, you know, talking their way and sharing their story kind of people. So I figured, well, I better learn the story and be able to tell it. And so we were in our New Jersey house. <laughs> and I invited a couple people and I actually took notes because I was so nervous, everything had to be perfect. I came from corporate America, everything had to be perfect. Because in corporate America, when you're out there selling your services to other clients, you want to put your best foot forward, obviously. So taking that skill set and putting it into play here, I had notes up on the beams of our house that only the people who, that I only, I could see. So you can imagine uh -huh. doing the, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I stop talking like oh, you always yeah, say yeah. don't be obvious you know point to it and say oh, I got <laughs> these notes up here and I'm like <laughs> trying to see the notes and I see people and you know, even my best friend who has lived out there who uh, was a horsewoman with you know interest because that's what I loved with my horses and I see her eyes closing like this <laughs> and <laughs> I see even David like <laughs> Drear, you know, his eyes are like tearing over. I couldn't wait till I finished, but I thought I had to finish it because I had to tell them the whole story. And they like that everybody stands up. They can't wait to make a beeline out the door. And I suddenly realized that may not be the best way to start building the business because how many people are going to be willing to do what I just did? Yeah. How many people are going to be looking up at the, you know, in the beams in their house? and wanting to retell that story. No one, zero, okay, zero. So, you know, being very studious and, you know, wanting to not impress people, but to, I, I was excited by the history. I was excited by, you know, the fact that there seemed to be some substance here. But the fact is, I mean, what if they had a tool that could tell that story, okay, that you could just push and plug in? And if we tell, tell the story, you know, in a couple of minutes, that would create that richness of history. And then a little, another video that would share, you know, about the business or a video that would share about the products, depending upon what people are interested in, take them down those pathways. That's what I came away with. I came away with, we need to have a system. 
okay, that anybody can do the same thing. It can, can they do the same thing that I just did? Will they want to do the same thing that I just did? And will we create leverage in doing that? Because I just thought, if I have to do this for everybody, I have to go out and give this presentation, and I have to face all these bored people that are nuts and crazy and looking at me, and I have to do this kind of a, a meeting over and over again, I would never have stayed in the profession. So what I learned is take, make it fun, okay? Make it interesting, make it fun, use the tools, follow the system. Okay, if the system is is offering you tools at each step along the way, plug and play. Because then everybody's evaluating while they're sitting there. That was the lesson that I learned. Everybody's evaluating. Well, that's good for Anne because she was a teacher. Well, that's good for Anne because she came out of corporate consulting. Well, that's good for Anne because, because, because. You don't want people thinking like that. You want people thinking, well, you know, if she pushed the button like you and I did that day, push the button... <laughs> held up some products, what got told her story, why she's excited and introduced you, okay? And we used the tools and you answered the questions. I can do that. And that was the lesson that I learned, the power of duplication and leverage. All right, for you guys watching and listening, subscribe to the channel. Tell your team about it. Make sure you go to duplicationnation.com. Look at the resources and the newsletter there. Uh, Annette, as always, it's my pleasure, my honor, my joy. Um, this was an amazing conversation that I know can really help some people. So thanks for doing it. And thanks for being you. My pleasure, my friend. All right, everybody. See you next time. Peace. Hey, guys, I'm back. And I just want to thank you for listening or watching and let you know if you made it this far, you are a serious, credible leader. You're somebody committed to success professionalism, and honing your craft, sharpening your saw. So I want to recommend a resource to you. It's a monthly newsletter called MLM Confidential. Leadership lesson every month, duplication lesson every month, something we call the dish, which is kind of the industry news, what's going on in the space who's moving where, what company is shutting down, what company is opening up, what is the, you know, the, the dish, the dirt of what's really going on behind the scenes that maybe the average person doesn't know. And there's a personal challenge every month. So check it out, mlmconfidential.com. I'll see you next week.